avoid just over the phone type of conversations. And you'll see why I present a lot of material. Um, and maybe you can do that at the first showing that you do. But again, with this, um, you know, avoiding as much contact as possible, I think this is probably going to be our best bet moving forward for that because it allows you to share documents as well. Um, okay, so again, just to give you a little bit of background on myself. So I've been on the Jay Schmidt group for um, two and a half years. I started September 2017. My wife and I bought our house from Jay back in 2016. Uh, just kept the conversation and our relationship going. And then eventually when I didn't want to do my corporate job anymore, um, I decided to get my real estate license. I've done real estate investing. Um, I've fixed and flipped five houses. Uh, I own a duplex. So just kind of coming at it from that angle of um, both the investment side and then also being a client and, and buying and selling uh, houses that way. Um, again, in, in my third year uh, with Keller Williams exclusively, uh, I think that we have some of the best models and some of the best minds to learn from. So again, kudos to all of you for, for showing up today. Um, what I'll do is I will go through and show you basically what my presentation looks like when I sit down and meet somebody, uh, just to give you all a visual. So I print out uh, and provide a folder like this, and it has everything that I'm gonna go through with everybody. Um, I put my business card in the folder. I would say don't, if you don't have a folder, don't let that hinder you from printing out the material and bringing it with you. Uh, use a manila, uh, manila folder, one of those, you know, a folder similar to this. Uh, write the client's name on it, just put it in there. Um, it's a great way for you to leave behind something that has a lot of information for them, but at the same time, um, isn't like a, a huge uh, thing that they can't take with them. So I'll share my screen because I want to show you all um, the different files that I use or that I pull. The way that I start out all of this and give it, maybe give it a second here, let me know if or when it starts sharing, I guess. There we go. Okay, can all of you see the screen here with zip forms on it? Okay, cool. Um, so what I do is I create a, uh, like a zip form folder almost, and I'll take you back to where that is. So on the zip forms here, you can just create new. And then I create a new offer to purchase. It pulls in, you know, everything that you would need as far as the forms are concerned. And I just labeled my new buyer consultation. Uh, I have similar forms for for sale by owners when I interact with a few of those. That's another one of my lead sources. Uh, but for um, new buyer consultations, going into the document section here, um, I just pull out all of these different documents. I also add in a few documents um, and I'll show you those. You can just upload those right into zip forms and then put them in your own folders. It's really, really nice. Uh, but pulling in the new residential offer to purchase, um, what I do when I print out all of these forms, there's a feature in here where if you go to print, you can print a sample and it basically allows you to pull up an offer to purchase, a real estate condition report, an addendum S, an addendum A, whatever it is, um, and puts it in this sample format. And I like to print that off and give it to people because this is something that you leave behind. I don't just want to give them a blank offer to purchase. It has my name on it. Um, so I always make sure that I use that sample option and then I just print all of those forms out there. So any questions on anything related to kind of where I get my information or where I pull all this stuff from. Okay, perfect. Um, so what I always start with is when we sit down, I always wanna start with an agenda and I can send you all this information so that you can use it as a, a template. Um, ours specifically, and I can show, I don't know if I'm sharing my screen, if it stops the, uh, the video here, but essentially this is our letterhead. Um, so it's a nicer form. You can print it off on something like that. Uh, um, but I like to go through the agenda. This allows the buyer to understand where the conversation is going. 
um, and to let them know that there's a few things that I want to accomplish today. All of it involves educating them and getting to know them, but at least they know that, you know, this is what they can expect. They can check those things off the list as we go. Um, I always start with their home search and their timeline. So I'd like to go through, ask them, you know, what it is that they're looking for, what's their budget, what's the area, uh, what has their experience been so far, have they found any houses, basically all the basic questions that you're going to ask any buyer uh, when you sit down with them for the first time. I then go ahead and go through the introductions. So when it comes to introductions, um, on the Jay Schmidt group, we have Kyle and Kyle does all of our marketing, which is really, really nice. So he puts together a lot of information for us that we can leverage and use when we present to buyers and sellers. Well, one of them is um, basically a who we are. It gives a breakdown of the team, uh, what we have on the team as far as operations, people, uh, transaction coordinators, interior designers, photographers, um, all of that. So the different people that they might interact with as they go. I then put together uh, my bio with my mugshot on it. So it just gives them a little opportunity to read more about me and who I am, where I came from. Um, and I don't go through this. I don't force people to like read this in front of me. That would be quite awkward. Um, but I just leave this with them. I say, you can read through this whenever you'd like. And then the other form that I have is just kind of a flow chart of if you were to work with us, uh, if you were to hire me as your agent, who are the people that you might interact with? And this goes again for both buyers and sellers, but for buyers, I always like to point out that um, I'm always gonna be your main point of contact. There's gonna be different people interacting with you along the way, um, but just know that if there's any issues or anything comes up, I'm always gonna be the person that you wanna call or reach out to right away. So for those of you that aren't on a team, uh, this is really where you can leverage the, um, the fact that we have a lot of people, a lot of resources for you. If you have a photographer that you work with more often than not, put that person in a flow chart like this, put Renee in a flow chart like this, put your title company resources in a flow chart like this, anything that you can do to make it seem that, and not even make it seem, we are essentially all on a team. Um, so you don't even have to make it seem like that. You are, you have a lot of people that interact with your buyers and your clients uh, at every step of the way. So really leverage the fact that it's not just me that you're hiring, you're hiring an entire set of team members, um, but make sure you do the, the right thing and introduce them early on so that they're not wondering, you know, who, why am I getting emails from this person? Is Ross supposed to be on this? Whatever it is. Uh, so I like to set that expectation that yes, it's me that we're going to be working with, um, but ultimately you're going to hear from a lot of these people on this uh, sheet here. Any questions on like my, the introduction of our team and who we are? Um, and all of that, again, for you single agents uh, or agents that aren't on a team, any questions about anything like that? Okay. Um, and Mandy, I can't see the, the chat on here, I don't think. So if there are things that come through, oh, there's chat, here we go, okay. Um, yeah, Peter, thank you. Um, so there are Keller Williams folders that you can use there, that's awesome. Um, so yes, please feel free to grab those um, and use those. So then I like to go through all of the paperwork. So I always make a joke that, you know, this is going to be the really exciting part of our presentation. We're going to go through all of the paperwork. Uh, the reason that I do all of this is I always tell my buyers, the real estate market today is moving very, very, very fast. Uh, you're going to see the house in the morning. We're going to go see it. You're going to fall in love with it. And then all of a sudden you're gonna to have to write an offer right away because there's four other people interested. It happens, right? Um, and I don't want that to be the first time that you see this paperwork that's gonna have you make one of the biggest financial decisions you're ever gonna make in your life. That's not fair to rush you through all of those emotions. So I wanna take the time, you know, an hour or so today to go over all of this, answer any questions that you might have. I don't expect people to memorize all of this. I always put that expectation that, you know, by no means should you read through this a hundred times. I just don't want it to be the first time you see it when all of a sudden we're writing an offer. Um, the other thing too is a lot of what we do is digital through um, DocuSign and through command. So this is one of those things that I do print out all of this material. You saw that in the folder that I presented. I print all this out so that they can have a hard copy of it because when you go through DocuSign, 
Sometimes it takes you immediately to the place that you're supposed to sign. And maybe you don't have time to go through it all. You don't have an hour to read through all the forms uh, because you have to submit your offer right away. So I always try to put this in front of them at that first meeting so that we can answer any questions and go through it all. So like I said, um, going through buyer agency, I print out that sample form, but essentially you have it right here. Um, when I print it out, I always go through and highlight the different areas. Um, so I'll highlight what it, you know, what's the title of this document. Uh, and then I outline basically, it points out the purchase price range, where it is that we're looking for. If there's any properties that either you have a previous, um, a previous affiliation with, I guess is the word, um, but basically anything you've already looked at that if you were to purchase it, I would step back um, and kind of stay away from that transaction. Outlines the compensation. So I always like to say that, you know, 2.4% of the purchase price is what my commission is. That's paid for by the seller. Um, so essentially the services that I provide to you are going to be at the cost of $295. That's our buyer agency fee. Uh, of which is paid for at closing. So you never really actually write me a check. Uh, it just gets added to your closing statement uh, when you purchase a home. And again, that's more of a success fee or a commission because I'm not gonna get paid until we find you the house that you're actually looking for. A lot of this, uh, a lot of this form, again, as you already know, is um, a lot of legal uh, definitions and things like that. So I tell people, if you want to read through this and ask questions, please feel free. I'm going to highlight some of the big major points that you should be concerned with, uh, and then we'll go from there. So in this section, I always like to touch on multiple representation. Uh, when I do print it out, I do highlight this first one. I don't highlight it saying this is what we have to do. I just mentioned that this is the most common way that we go about it. Um, and that would be that obviously if we're seeing a house that's also listed by a Keller Williams agent, we can still write on that house. Uh, it's just that they need separated uh, agency. And I always make that very, very clear with my clients that even if I have a listing that you might be potentially purchasing, I'm not going to represent you in that transaction because we view that as a conflict of interest. So that's typically the way that I present it. The one luxury that we have as um, the Jay Schmidt group that some of you single agents may not, um, but maybe you can work out a referral agreement with another agent in the office. But with the J. Spick group, if I'm the listing agent on uh, a property and my buyer wants to write on it, I can leverage either Jay or Janine to represent my buyer. And then we work out an agreement uh, through the team aspect. So again, if you're an, indivi an individual agent, um, certainly maybe connect with another agent that in that rare circumstance that you have that um, you get a referral out of it. I actually had that happen um, on a listing that I had down in Racine recently. Uh, I met the buyers at an open house. They were unrepresented. I did not want to represent them. Um, so I gave the lead to another agent and then they gave me a referral. So it's a great way to, to be able to still maintain your fiduciary to either your client um, on the listing side or the buy side. Uh, but yeah, I always like to go over that and then obviously explain the other two as well uh, so that they understand what this means. Any confidential information that they don't want me to share, I tell them, you know, jokingly, obviously I'm not going to tell them everything about your life, uh, but if there's anything specifically that I absolutely cannot share with um, a co-broke or anything like that, please let me know. And then... I also point out the fact that this is a rental agreement. So if we were looking for rentals, this is where we would do it here. We're not going to worry about that today. Um, and then the other thing I like to go over is the term of the agreement. So I do tell people that, yes, there is going to be dates on this, that it looks like it's you know locked in. Typically, they run for six months. Um, but I do tell people that Wisconsin is what's called a service contract state. And uh, if at any time I am not producing what it is that I've promised them or if they don't feel that I'm serving them at a high level to please reach out to me and let me know that um, they'd like to terminate the agreement. No hard feelings. Um, it's, you know, it's usually my fault if something like that happens and I don't want them to feel like they're locked into a contract just because they signed it. If they don't want to work with me, I don't want to force them to. 
Um, so I always make sure that even though there are dates on this, I want them to feel very, very comfortable that if they need to, we can end this agreement and they can go on and look at different houses. Um, I do always tell them though, you know, please tell me if that's the case. I don't want you signing multiple buyer agency agreements because that's when things can get a little difficult. Um, so just please let me know if at any point you want to end our contract and we can do that. Everybody signs it and then off we go. So that's buyer agency agreement. Any questions on that or has anybody had any issues with buyer agency, explaining it, um, working with clients, anything like that? Good. All right. Perfect. Um, again, going back to our agenda, um, I then get into an MLS data sheet. So typically what I do is if I know, if I've talked with the client or the buyer over the phone a little bit and I get a little idea of either where they're looking or what, what type of property they're looking for, what area, something like that, I always like to pull an active property on the MLS and print out that sheet. And the reason that I do that is because I explain to them that the MLS is where they're going to start getting a lot of the houses that they're going to start seeing. We're going to send them, we're going to set them up on those automatic email campaigns. And the information on an MLS data sheet is the exact same as what they're going to see on Zillow or Realtor.com or Trulia, whatever it is, uh, but it's going to be laid out a lot differently. So I always like to tell people that, you know, when you look at something like this, it has all the same information, but here's where it's going to be located on this sheet. So as we go through and find out you know, what it is that they're looking for in a house, I like to point that out on the MLS data sheet. If they absolutely must have uh, a fireplace, here's where the fireplace is gonna be listed that it has one. If they absolutely need to have central air, this is where it's gonna be listed. Um, so those are the sorts of things, you know, if they have to stay below a certain tax number or whatever it might be. I just like to lay out the MLS data sheet because it is, as you all know, laid out a little differently than you know, most of the consumer websites and the consumer apps that we have. Um, then we get into the offer to purchase. So I literally do the exact same thing that I just did with buyer agency for the offer to purchase. Uh, I go through all of the different sections of it. And again, by printing out that sample, it allows you to print it out. Um, go through and highlight all of the specific areas. So the areas that I always like to highlight are the residential offer to purchase up here. Um, I tell them, you know, the purchase price is what we're going to offer for the property. Included and excluded uh, or not included. I put as much emphasis on the included or on the not included, excuse me, as I do on the included. And here's the reason why. Um, sometimes there's things in a house and we all know this, that someone does not want, or a seller thinks that they're doing you a favor by leaving behind. And as you're going through a house with your clients, if you notice that there's something in the basement, um, for example, a pool table, maybe they don't want a pool table in the basement. And if you've ever moved a pool table, you know that you probably don't want to move it again because they're, <laughs> they're incredibly heavy, especially when you put them in a basement. So I always like to say, if we're going through a house and you notice that there's something that isn't listed in the included and it's not listed in the excluded, let's specify it in either one of these sections here. An in-ground pool, those are kind of a love-hate for a lot of people. Um, paint cans in the basement, extra wood in the garage, like all this kind of stuff. If you notice that there's those specifics, um, addressing it now in this stage of the transaction is a lot better than doing it the day before closing and having to scramble. Um, and maybe having an unhappy seller or an unhappy buyer uh, that you're having to, or co-broke that you're having to, to negotiate with. So again, I put as much emphasis on the not included as I do on the included. I then go to, I then go through talk about binding acceptance. Um, the one thing I like to point out about binding acceptance is that it technically is a courtesy. Uh, ideally, we'd like to hear back from the seller or the agent within that timeline, but they don't have to especially if they already plan on countering the offer uh, or a multiple counter, they don't technically have to respond to us by that timeline. So I like to set that expectation with the buyer to say, we're going to put a date and a time on here. Um, but just so you know, there's no guarantee. Um, this is another thing that I like to mention is I'm always in communication with the agent. If there is a property that we really, really want to see and we really want to write on, 
I'm immediately on the phone after our showing, talking to the agent about, you know, what are some of the things that we can put into our offer to differentiate ourselves? Um, when do you plan on meeting with the seller? Do you need a few, you know, extra days or hours? Um, or, you know, if I tell you that we need to hear back by tonight, is that reasonable? Always like, like, like to set that expectation um, with that co-broke. Um, the thing I'd point out about the binding acceptance as well is let's say, you know, we put it for noon tomorrow that we want to hear back. We don't hear back until 2 p.m. tomorrow, but we find out that the seller did in fact accept our offer, but it was after the binding acceptance timeline. I do tell the buyers that at that point, you need to re-accept their acceptance. Um, so I try to alleviate all of those questions or set those expectations as much as possible there. Again, outlining the, the closing. When it comes to the closing, this is where I typically like to try to play the, um, the mortgage game a little bit. Uh, so obviously talk to a lender before you give out any of this advice. Uh, but in my experience, uh, as long as you close a day or two after the first of the month. So for example, if we were to write an offer and close on uh, April 2nd, the first mortgage payment for that buyer might not be due until June 1st, which if they're in a rental currently, uh, and maybe their lease is up in June, doesn't allow for overlap, which is really nice for them. Uh, if they plan on doing work to the property um, and they don't wanna live there while they're doing it, again, allows them not to have to move in right away. Um, so again, just check with your mortgage lender or have them ask the mortgage lender, but just know that you can be very strategic on when you close and play to your buyer's advantage when it comes to just keeping um, deferring that mortgage as much as possible. They still accrue interest on the mortgage. Um, it's just that they don't have to worry about principal um, until, you know, essentially, and in this example, almost 60 days until after they buy the house, which can be very advantageous. Can also be very advantageous in a rent back situation if you're offering that. It's becoming more and more common, uh, at least in the offers that I'm writing and the offers that I'm receiving. Um, so again, knowing that you can start receiving that rent payment if you're the buyer and you're offering post occupancy to your to your um, to the seller, you can start receiving rent right on the closing statement day one. They start paying you rent. Your first mortgage won't be due for 60 days. So there's an opportunity where again, there's not going to be that overlap. You might actually make some money on this situation. So again, just explaining what closing is and again, talking through, you know, based on my conversation with the co-broke, this is when the ideal closing would be or that ideal scenario. Earnest money, uh, I like to touch on this because this is one of those expenses that for a buyer, it is going to be cashed. So I always like to set that expectation that there are a few expenses that come out of pocket, uh, out of pocket before you close on a house, earnest money being one of them. Um, so we all know the talk track as far as typically 1% uh, of purchase price. If you're dealing with a house around $250,000, you know, $2,000, $2,500, anywhere around there is going to be safe. Uh, so make sure you kind of feel that out with your clients before, um, before putting down a, a number and make sure that you let them know that that is a check that does get cashed. Um, I always reassure them that earnest money or the contracts in general are very, are very buyer friendly. So I like to talk about how, you know, it's not like you're just giving away this money. Uh, it is credited back to you. If something were to happen, we have an opportunity to get it back. And typically we're going to uh, really, in my experience, the only instance where earnest money has been kept is if someone wakes up one day and says, yeah, you know what? I don't really want that house. You know, there's no real, contingency that they've been able to, to lean on to get out of the contract. I then touch on the real estate condition report. I talk to the buyers and let them know that this is essentially the seller's report card on their property. Um, we'll get into it later as far as what a real estate condition report looks like, uh, but just know that this is where they're going to uh, disclose everything that they know that's wrong with the property. You will be signing that real estate condition report uh, and basically what you're saying is that we understand that these are things that might be wrong with the property. We're still going to be submitting our offer um, knowing those things. So it's not that we can't investigate them further or see if they're larger issues down the road. Uh, it's just that you're not able to cite that specific issue as a reason for you not to buy the house in the future. 
Again, a lot more um, legal jargon definitions within the contract. I then like to go through the inspection contingency, let them know that, you know, that's one of our biggest contingencies in most offers is the inspection. We typically try to get that done within 10 to 15 days, depending on the buyer's schedule. And then I always like to touch on the right to cure. Um, I borrow the right to cure uh, talk track from Jay and feel free to use this uh, as well, unless you have your own personal story about where a right to cure has maybe burned you in the past. Uh, but Jay has been very open about one of the situations that he had. Um, it was a foundation issue. The seller had the right to cure. And in that issue, the buyer's expert came in and said that there needed to be all new drain tile around the entire basement. Um, and it was going to be, I think he said somewhere in the neighborhood of, you know, more than $5,000 it was going to be. The seller's uh, person came in and they their experts said basically all they needed to do was some exterior grading and then one small corner of the basement that needed new drain tile and that was it. Um, so because they couldn't come to an agreement within the inspection amendment, the seller's uh, inspector, the seller's uh, expert trumped the buyer's expert. Um, so I always like to point out that that's kind of what you're, uh, the, you're relinquishing that control at that point. Um, and I mentioned to buyers, there's a couple different ways that we can approach the right to cure. Um, the right to cure is something that I try to take on a case by case basis. There are going to be some homes where I'm going to feel very, very comfortable giving the seller the right to cure just based on walking through the house. If you can tell that, you know, they tend to use higher end, um, furnaces or air conditioners or, um, you know, things just are put together better. Um, they're constructed well, they've been fixed, they haven't cut corners on things, they haven't used the cheapest products, uh, whatever it might be. I typically use that as a way to ease the buyers into giving someone the right to cure, especially in a um, competitive situation. It's one of those things that can make your offer stand out. Uh, the other thing too, I just sold a house in Wauwatosa. It was on the market for a while. Uh, we went in at a pretty aggressive uh, price to offer them. And when we did that, I said, one of the things that you could do is you could give them the right to cure to kind of ease their mind. And the reason we did that is the appliances in this house, the house was built in, I think, 1963 or something like that. They were original appliances in the house, aside from the refrigerator. Um, so when it came to something like that, I just said, you know, when you look at something like that, People are taking care of this house. Um, the outside was tuck pointed in areas that it needed it. The driveway was sealed. You know, there were certain things that were pointed out to me just looking at it that had me feel, okay, if there is a large issue or something comes up, this seller isn't going to let the buyer inherit a bad property um, or a bad product. So I would say that we give them the right to cure just knowing how they've cared for or taken care of the house so far. Uh, in no way do you have to take my advice on that. If you don't feel comfortable, please don't give the seller the right to cure because there are things that can go wrong. Um, but just know that, you know, this is really a last resort, that right to cure. Hopefully we come through an, uh, uh, an agreement through the negotiations of the inspection amendment. But I'd just like to highlight the fact that this is what the right to cure means. And this is what either you're retaining or you're relinquishing when it comes to um, discussing those issues. Annie, did that answer your question on the inspection portion or? Um, no, actually I have a, um, a question. Um, so I wrote an offer yesterday on a house um, for my client. And I was always told on line, or line 198, 199, um, when it says uh, the offer is further contingent upon a qualified inspector or um, independent qualified third party performing an inspection of the roof foundation and anything deemed necessary by buyer or home inspector. And so that's just a standard one that I put in. Um, last night, the listing agent um, texted me because <clears throat> the property just went on yesterday. We happened, we saw it right away. We wrote that we we're in a competitive situation and she had to reach out to me saying, are you going to be doing more inspections on the roof. Is that what that line, is that what you're saying? Is that you're gonna have special people come out and look at the roof and the foundation? And, and so it kind of freaked her out a little bit. And is that standard? 
What's your so, thoughts? Yeah, and I think this actually changed with the new offer to purchase. Um, I could be wrong, but I know that the inspection contingency section got rearranged a little bit. And Annie, I used to always do what you did is I would put in the inspection contingency. And then from, from what I remember, the old one did not have like one, two, three listed. It just had the inspection contingency. And then it would have like a semicolon at the end and you could write in some additional pieces. And I would always put roof mechanicals, entire premise of the property. That is what I always put in. Um, I've since gotten rid of that language on mine um, because of line one, um, but also because line two, it just adds an additional layer to it. Um, so I guess it's one of those things that if you can put it in there and talk through it with the co-broke, um, or maybe just get ahead of it. Just let them know, hey, in my, cons in my inspection contingency, I have listed the roof, the mechanicals, uh, the foundation. No, we're not going to be bringing in additional people for it, but I just want it where if the inspector tells us or deems it necessary that we should bring them in, I just want to be able to do that without any issue. Does that help or does that make sense? Because I'm with you 100%. I used to put that in and then when this new offer to purchase came out, I actually took that out because I thought it was potentially redundant, but I'm not hundred percent on that. And Annie just texted me. She lost her feed. Um, oh. <laughs> so I am recording this. I'll post it on the Facebook group after um, if she oh. doesn't jump back on here, but for people who have questions on the inspection contingency and the right to cure, it is, it is such a huge part of the contract. Kimmy is actually doing a training just on inspection contingency and right to cure because there have been some changes with it, Ross. Um, so that's next Thursday at one. Obviously, if you're working on a deal right now where you need that information now, call Kimmy. Um, but if you can jump on that, I'll make sure to record that one too. But um, it can be, you know, a difficult section. For sure. And Annie, <laughs> it looks like you just were able to come back on, which is good. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. Sorry, um, Annie. Annie, I'm going to so, go ahead and post this too, but um, I don't know where you cut off. That's there. fine. And I can listen to it. <laughs> where did, where did I cut off for you? Where did I leave? You? Uh, just that it's, that it has been renumbered and, um, and I, you know, and, and actually in looking at this, it does list all the things that I put on here anyway. So maybe it's not so good to put it on anymore. Right. So it, it seems a bit redundant. I used to do the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but the other thing that I was mentioning too, is if you do put that in there, potentially let the co-broke know ahead of time um, or give them a heads up to say, hey, this is gonna be listed in my inspection contingency. Not that we're gonna be specifically bringing in a roof contractor or a foundation expert. Uh, it's just that if it's deemed necessary by the home inspector, like you mentioned, um, we just wanna be able to, to do that without any issue. So don't think that we're gonna bring up 100 contractors to this house to look at it you know, up and down. It's just we're trying to cover all our bases there. Great. What? Just out of curiosity, what do you put in that line now? Do you put an, a canned thing there? I leave it as is. I leave it unfilled. Okay. okay. Great. Great. Perfect. Um, but then, as Mandy mentioned too, Kimmy's going to be doing a you know just right. a specific section on this. So she's a hell of a lot smarter than I am. So listen to her if she tells you. <laughs> Thank <otherwise>. you. <laughs> Yeah, Annie, her next Thursday contract training is all on inspection contingency and right to cure. But if you need something before that, give her a call, shoot her a text. She's always available to help too. Okay, uh, next section going through radon contingency. Um, I explained what radon is. Essentially, it's uh, a gas that gets released from the breakdown of rocks and minerals. Um, it's The reason that it's an issue is because it comes through a concrete foundation, which is porous, so it can seep through, gas can seep through the foundation. When it gets confined in a space, like a basement or in a house, that's where it becomes dangerous. So essentially what a radon mitigation system is, is a giant fan that gets put into your foundation, sucks up all of the radon gas, spits it out into the air over the roof line of the house, where the rest of us can all get sick. Um, but no, I just mentioned that it dissipates into the air at that point. So that's really the fix for it. Um, I like to play with this one as well, similar to um, that right to cure, being able to talk a buyer through what a radon test is or what a radon mitigation system costs. So 
The reason I do that is because if a seller sees radon testing contingency, typically they automatically assume that it's a thousand dollars less. They're going to take a thousand dollars less because that's what a radon mitigation system costs. Um, not always the case, obviously. Um, if there's low levels of radon in the house, then it's all good. It's fine. Um, but I do like to talk to buyers, you know, if it's again, a competitive situation, yes, it's a thousand dollars. That's not a small amount of money, but in the grand scheme of things, it's something that if you feel comfortable being able to take care of it, we can still test for it to see if it's in the house. But if we don't have a contingency, it's just going to be up to you to put in that radon mitigation system at some point after closing. So I just like to feel buyers out. I like to give them the option and let them know that we'll probably do this on a case by case basis, depending on how competitive uh, of a house we're looking at. Going through the financing contingency, uh, I let them know that, you know, I will take all of these numbers from your lender or from your pre-approval letter based on how much we're going to finance, the interest rate, uh, all of that. So I just talked through, through basically putting in here that if we don't get the financing for the house, we're able to back out. Um, I then talked through the appraisal. So essentially you want to make sure that the house is worth what it is that you're offering or what you're buying it for, because if it's not, um, then you have to come up with a difference if we don't have that contingency in here. So financing appraisal contingency kind of go hand in hand. I like to talk through that. And then uh, depending on the buyers that I'm working with, uh, if you already know that they're a first time home buyer, you can certainly skip over this section as far as closing a buyer's property, bump clause, things like that. Um, but if you're working with someone that does in fact need to sell their house, uh, you wanna let them know that, you know, this is a contingency that we're able to put into our offer, uh, making sure that they sell their home or have a, a closing on their home. Um, otherwise, if it, again, if it's a competitive situation, you might want to have them talk to their lender about a potential bridge loan and you want to do it early on so that you don't have to have those questions answered uh, as you're writing an offer. Typically for a lender to look into a bridge loan and to give their, um, to give your clients a pretty accurate idea of it, it's going to take a few days for them to do that. So by sitting down with your clients now, not in a rush uh, during this meeting, you can talk to them about that and say, Hey, just so you know, reach out to your lender, ask them about a bridge loan, just to see if it's an option if we need to use it. Secondary offers, uh, I talked through that briefly, just letting them know that you know if we don't get the primary offer, we can certainly submit a secondary offer. Basically, if anything goes wrong with that primary offer, you slide into um, you slide into primary and you're able to buy the house. We want to keep this timeline relatively short um, because of the fact that you can't write two offers, if you're already in a secondary and the next day uh, a great house comes up and you wanna buy it, you're running the risk of potentially being under contract on two homes. Um, so we like to leave this somewhere around like the 48 hour, 72 hour range um, and just kind of leave it open for the buyers to be able to continue shopping if they come across the right house. Um, closing prorations, I like to go over this as well to let people know that they're not going to be paying taxes and utilities for a house that they're not living in. So the seller is going to provide their portion of the taxes, the utilities on the closing statement. When the tax bill comes or the water bill comes um, and it gets sent to the house, the buyer is going to be responsible for the full bill, but they'll have been you know, compensated for the seller's portion up until then. So I typically... Um, as a default, just always go with that first option. Um, the only time I don't is either on um, like brand new construction or a house that has been extensively renovated and flipped where the assessed value might change quite a bit. And then your buyers will be stuck with the tax bill after that. Um, and then I also do it on when it starts to get to either very into December or really early on in uh, January. I just like to explore the other options just to see what one might fit best. But nine times out of 10, that first option is always gonna be your best bet. Um, okay, a lot more definitions, lovely definitions here. Uh, on this page, I like to go through these two uh, scenarios, the property damage between acceptance and closing. I don't do this to scare people, but again, you can use this example. Um, the reason I bring it up is because we hope it doesn't happen, but sometimes it does happen. 
So in between the time we get an accepted offer and when we actually close on the property, if there is any damage to the property, um, if it's less than 5% of the purchase price, the seller can fix it and you still buy the house. If it's more than 5% of the purchase price, the buyer then has the opportunity to say, yes, you can go ahead and fix it and I'll still buy it. Or you know what, it's too much damage. I've decided I don't want your house anymore. So for example, less than 5% of the purchase price, the, um, the ice maker on the refrigerator breaks and leaks all over the floor. They have to replace some of the floor in the kitchen, less than 5%. The neighbor kid hits a baseball through one of the windows, breaks, breaks, the, uh, breaks the window. They fix that, you buy the house. Uh, more than 5% is the story that uh, my mother-in-law worked with someone who was selling their house. And it was right around the 4th of July holiday. They had a party, uh, they had fireworks, a firework hit the gutter and burned half the house down. Um, and when that happened, that started a chain event of the house that they were gonna buy, they could no longer buy, the house that those people were buying and the, those people were selling, like it just created a domino effect of like eight transactions that either got delayed or completely thrown off because there was that damage done to the house. So again, not to scare you, just know that it could happen. And if it does, you're covered in this section of the offer to purchase. So feel free to borrow that story because um, it does, it happens. Um, and then on this section here, I also like to just mention that we do have an opportunity to walk through the property up to three days before closing. This is our opportunity to check and see if the things that we asked them to fix were fixed um, to make sure that they are moving out of the house or, you know, are there still pictures on the wall, clothes in the closets, all of that type of thing um, that they're just not going to be able to get out. So just being able to get ahead of that. Um, and then also a nice opportunity. We talked earlier about what's not included or what is included in the purchase price. Just to verify that, like, hey, just so you know, there's that you know, built-in desk that you have in that guest bedroom, we did put that we don't want that. So please make sure that that's gone before closing, you know, just reiterating that to the co-broker. And then finally, uh, I just put in here that if we have any addendums, we attach those here, sellers, buyer sign, seller sign, and then off it goes. So that's the offer to purchase. Um, and that's literally how extensively I will go through it. So it does take a little bit of time. Uh, it can be dull, but as long as you bring the attitude and the professionalism and the competence for it, you're able to get through it and answer any questions that people have. So I go through that. Uh, next up, I go through all of the addendum. So I go through uh, the addendum A and I talk about if we're asking for seller contributions, if we're asking for a home warranty, if there's an association fee, either for a condo or just a, like a home neighborhood association, whatever it might be, that's gonna be listed here. Um, and then also too, for those of you that may or may not have come across this before, um, there is the well water testing, well system testing, and then a sanitary system or essentially the, the mound system for the, the property. These are typically costs or tests that are covered by the seller to ensure that the, not only the, the water itself uh, is safe and clean to drink and use, but also the, um, the systems that are being used to either pump the water or to clean it or whatever it is that they're in working order. Um, because again, if they're on the end of their life, that's another expense that your sellers or your, excuse me, your buyers might have to inherit from the sellers. Um, so just know that these um, well testing and then also the mound system or the private sanitary system, those are tests that are typically inherited by the seller. Um, they are a couple hundred dollars, you know, anywhere from 500 to a thousand dollars for all of those to be tested. Um, but just know when writing an offer that you typically put those as seller expenses. And then I say the exact same thing as we go through, everybody signs it, we attach it to the offer and then off we go. Close to the end, believe it or not. Um, so then I go through the addendum S. The things I like to point out in the addendum S is that ideally uh, we're looking for the seller disclosures to be none, that we don't want to see anything written in there, that they're aware of any lead-based paint in a house. They sign it. The thing that I always like to reassure a buyer about, and this is actually my favorite part of this amendment or this addendum, is it requires both agents to sign this document. So 
I'm reassuring my buyers that as we go through a house, you're obviously looking at you know the layout and the finishes and all that sort of thing. These are the type of things that I'm going to be looking for. Am I looking for chipping paint around windows or on baseboards or things like that? I need, not only does the listing agent need to do their due diligence to make sure that there's not lead-based paint in the house, but I also need to do that same thing as we're going through a house. So there's just that added layer of accountability um, that tends to give buyers a little bit of a, an ease as you go through. And then just mention to them that as long as we don't see any evidence of it, we waive our opportunity for a lead-based paint inspection. Everybody signs it and off we go. Finally, the real estate condition report. Um, ideally, what you do is you see obviously a lot of no's or NA on this. Um, if I know that, again, talking through what we talked about with the, um, with the MLS sheet, if you know what area your clients are looking for, what type of house that they're looking for, you can print off an MLS sheet that actually speaks to them and like the type of house that they're going to be potentially looking at. At the same time, also go into MLS and print out that addendum S and that wrecker and present that as your presentation to let them know this is what an actual real estate condition report looks like. There's a potential that it has things on it that you can talk through. You know, people knew that there was a leak in the basement or they knew that um, the roof leaked at some point or whatever it might be. You can talk through those different scenarios with a very specific example. So if I don't know where this buyer is looking or what they're doing, I won't print out um, an MLS version. I'll just print out the sample version. But if I know that they're looking in Bayview up to $300,000, I'll go in and try to find a Bayview house for $300,000, print off the MLS sheet, print off the addendum S, and print off the wrecker that comes with it. Again, everybody signs it, and we submit that with the offer. So that's my presentation. And then everybody takes a big breath and a sigh because we got through all of those documents and all that paperwork. Um, I reiterate again that I don't expect them to memorize all of that. It's really just the goal is to make sure that this wasn't the first time that they saw it when they're writing an offer and making that big emotional decision. Um, I then go into what um, expenses can be expected. So we talk about the earnest money being an expense. And then I also talk about the inspection and the radon testing if they do that. So typically an inspection and radon test can run anywhere from 400 to $600, depending on the size of the house uh, and the inspector that you use. So I always try to give people an idea of, you know, what money is coming out of pocket right away and to be prepared to, to write those checks. Um, I also reassure them that unless they have a relationship with a home inspector that they trust, um, I have someone that I use almost exclusively what I can. I really trust him. Uh, the reason that I do is that he provides a lot of education as he goes through and inspects a home. He stays um, very level-headed. He doesn't get too emotional about anything. It's just very matter of fact. Um, but he points out things that aren't just issues with the house. He'll point out things that, you know, because you have a brick exterior, these are some of those things that you should be watching for for the, you know, five years that you own this home or every single spring come out and check that your downspouts are all connected, like little stuff like that. So he just educates people along the way. Um, I use Kelly Kucha from Extensive Home Inspections. Um, I can certainly share that information with you guys afterwards as well. Uh, he's, in my opinion, he's, he's great. Um, I love working with him. Um, the last thing that I show people or the last thing that I leave them with is the letter. Um, so this is a letter that I received on one of my listings. I thought it was a really good letter. Um, so I print this off and I give this to them and I tell my buyers, use this as a template, go home within the next few days and put together an actual letter. And then that way, when we find the perfect house, you can come through and just plug in a few things about the house that really stood out to you. Um, so for example, you know, these people put in here, as we walked around, we loved how open the layout was, would be perfect for hosting family members for holidays and gatherings, the large kitchen space um, where we can prep or, you know, essentially just host people. That was one of the things that stood out to them, really connected with the homeowners. But the rest of this, as far as who they are, when they got married, if they have pets, um, you know, are they new to the area or what do they like about the area? All of that is going to stay the same. 
really the only thing that they had to change was these two or three sentences and they can do that right away. So again, just prepping your buyers to be ready and say, not that we're gonna submit this offer tomorrow, but just make sure you have this letter kind of formatted and ready to go so that when I ask you for it, you can quickly go in there, type up a few things and send it along with our offer. So I always like to set that expectation. Um, and then I briefly touch on the home inspection. Um, I joke with people that when we come across the house that you're gonna write an offer on, you walk in, it's the perfect house, it's great, it's got everything that you've been looking for, and then we have the home inspection and the house is gonna fall over tomorrow. Um, that's what their job is, to find the issues with it. Um, it's gonna be an emotional experience as you go through all this. Uh, I, I like to reassure people that I have done renovations and I've invested in real estate previously. Uh, and also, you know, we've also just bought and sold houses. Uh, all of us agents have done that. So let them know that this is something that you see all the time. Um, and it's your job to make sure that you point out those things that are the most important or the most detrimental. Uh, also, don't be afraid to tell buyers that if there is something that's really, really wrong with a house and they don't see it, um, you're going to speak up and just kind of guide them and say, this is my recommendation. I've, I haven't done it very often, but there's been two or three homes where I've talked buyers out of that house to say, you know, I, I just don't think that this is the right house for you to get. I don't want to, I don't want you to inherit, you know, these headaches or whatever it might be. Um, so yeah, that's what I go through with my buyer consultations. Uh, I usually wrap up by saying, um, I'm very passionate about real estate. My wife is fortunately very understanding. She understands that I really enjoy what I do. So if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to call, text, or email me. Uh, and then I like to joke and say, if you ever are like sitting on the couch at night and you're like, oh, I don't want to bother Ross, I'll, I'll talk to him later. If you ever come across the thought of, I don't want to bother Ross, please send whatever it is you're thinking about because you're not bothering me. I don't care if it's um, nine o'clock at night or seven in the morning. Uh, I might not get back to you right away because there are you know, times that I spend time with my family or my wife, um, but please don't hesitate or feel like you're not, you're bothering me so you're not gonna send something to me. I'd rather have you tell me uh, and then we can deal with it as we go, but don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. And then we go on our way. Um, and I'd let them know that I'm going to send them, you know, houses. I get their contact information and off we go. So one of the things I don't do, which maybe some of you do, uh, as you can tell, just kind of talking through this, that took about an hour. So my buyer consultations last typically an hour, hour and a half, depending on the side conversations that we have. Um, but I don't typically show homes on the MLS during this process. Not saying that you can't do it. I actually think it might be a thing for me to consider doing. Um, but I just try not to bog down the presentation with opening up a laptop and things like that uh, and going through all of it. But if you do all of this stuff electronically, if you have a tablet, whatever it is, you can easily pop on and show the MLS. Certainly feel free to do that. It's just that I typically set the expectation that we're gonna go through all the paperwork and then we're gonna start looking at the houses uh, after that. Ross, do you typically want people to be pre-approved before doing all of this or what's your stance on your timeline for when you're willing to spend, you know, all this time going through it? Good question. Um, so I'll meet with anybody at any stage um, just because I want to make sure that I establish that connection. Uh, and also it gives me an opportunity to provide a recommendation if they haven't been pre-approved already, or even if they have. Um, I always bring that up in the conversation. For me, it's a really easy topic to cover when I get to that financing contingency. Um, so I kind of allude to the fact that I'm going to use, you know, your pre-approval letter to pull all this information as far as what it is we're going to put down. Um, do you guys have a pre-approval letter that I can reference or look at? And then if they say yes, you know, great. Who do you, who, oh, who'd you get pre-approved with? Um, and if it's a lender that uh, is a little sketchy. So for example, I had a buyer consultation a few weeks ago and they got approved through Chase. Um, not that Chase is a bad lender. People have had, I've had great experiences with them in the past. I've had some not great experiences with them in the past. Um, but I just told them that, you know, would you be open to talking to um, Jake Showman and his team over at Bank of England? I work with them a lot. I, you know, I communicate with them. I trust their process. They provide a lot of education, you know, and it's a good opportunity to get a second opinion. Would you at least be open to having that conversation? Um, 
So yeah, to answer your question, Mandy, I'll have a conversation with anybody at any point, um, but I'd like to bring up that pre-approval because it can be, for some people, a little awkward, like it's a very blunt question, like are you approved to buy a house? Um, talking about it in that financing contingency section, for me, makes it a really easy talking point. Sure, makes sense, thanks. Anyone have other questions for Ross? Perfect buyer consultation. Awesome. I love it. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much, Ross. If you want to go ahead and just email me your buyer consultation agenda, I can post it for everyone. Um, of and recording of the video. So thank you, Ross. It was amazing. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks, Ross. Good Thanks, to see everyone. You. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Wash your hands. Stay safe, everyone. <laughs>